Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks to Rohan Hitchcock coming to you from Australia. Uh, take it away, Rohan. Thanks, Dan. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Rowan, uh, and I'm here to talk about the, uh, or here to do the second mechanistic interpretability uh, lecture. Um, okay, so uh, in this talk, we're going to be looking at uh, circuits in, in neural networks. So uh, a circuit is uh, a part of a neural network which performs a certain task or algorithm. Um, so for example, we could have a subset of neurons uh, which are dedicated to, say, detecting curves in images or um, adding numbers when they've been written as text or executing Python code or, or whatever. Um, generally, we define circuits by, by what they do rather than, than how they, they do it. Um, and uh, several, you know, a bunch of circuits have been identified in, in neural networks uh, uh, in the past. So uh, there's a paper out there looking at circuits in, in transformer models performing um, modular addition, and these circuits have been fully reverse engineered and, and understood. Um, as I sort of mentioned before, we've got this idea of circuits in, in convolutional neural networks. Um, I think this was mentioned in a previous talk, um, such as for edge or curve detection. Um, the term circuits wasn't used when these were being studied, but uh, it's the same it's the same idea. Um, and in general, a lot of mechanistic interpretability, uh, at least as far as what I can see, uh, is dedicated to identifying the presence of certain circuits um, and understanding how they work with the with the view to having that inform how we uh, understand the the neural network to be to be working. Um, okay, so, the goal of this talk is to give an overview of circuits, of how circuits in transformers are studied. Um, and we're going to be using this paper in context learning and induction heads um, from Anthropic uh, as, uh, as a case study uh, uh, in how to do this. Um, we'll begin with a brief overview of transformer architecture and uh, of in context learning. Um, and then the majority of the talk will be a discussion of the paper, uh, the in-context learning and induction heads paper. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a sort of discussion of, of how this can represent a bit of a framework for studying circuits. Uh, and also secondarily, sort of what the paper um, might suggest in the context of SLT and phase transitions and the other stuff we've been talking about uh, in, this, in this seminar. Um, cool. Uh, so let's quickly talk about transformers. So language model transformers like GPT-4, GPT-3, uh, process sequences of tokens, uh, which are generally words or, or parts of words. Um, and the output of, of uh, this sequence of tokens is a sequence of probability distributions uh, on the next token given, uh, the, preceding, given the preceding tokens. Um, it begins by embedding each token into, into some high dimensional vector space, Rn, um, using this uh, embedding layer. Uh, and then this uh, representation is processed by a sequence of, of transformer blocks. Um, and generally people think about each transformer block as updating the representation of each token. Um, and then the probability distributions are then extracted from this representation using an unembedding layer. Um, and really for this talk, we're going to focus on the transformer blocks and some quantities that are calculated within those transformer blocks. Um, and we won't have much to say about the embedding and unembedding steps. So let's take a look at what happens in a transformer block, focusing on the representation, on how the representation of, of one token um, XT is, is updated by this block. Um, so the first step and the most important step for, for this talk is this attention calculation. Um, and we call uh, the part of the model which, which does this calculation uh, an attention head. Um, and I, I won't go into details about how this calculation is performed. It's not, it's not difficult, um, but uh, as part of this attention calculation, uh, the attention head assigns to each preceding token uh, a value uh, called an attention score. And the way to think about this is as scoring the relative importance of that token uh, to the current token uh, relative, relative to the other preceding tokens. Um, 
often I've, I've drawn one attention head sort of one attention calculation happening here um, but in in most in the models we'll be dealing with in this paper and in most large transformer models um, the there are multiple attention calculations happening in parallel at this step uh, whose results are then uh, then averaged uh, and then added to to update the representation of x uh, xt um, after the attention calculation, uh, there's an additional fully connected section, um, which is uh, so this this MPL uh, sorry MLP bit here, um, usually on the order of of two layers, um, and uh, yeah, so that that generally happens after this. Uh, and in fact, some of the models that we'll talk about in this in this uh, or the the paper discusses completely omit this section as well. Although the large language models uh, generally do have these these things <clears throat> okay um before so that's what we need to know about transformers to, to talk about this paper um and before we go on and discuss the paper let's just briefly recall what we mean by in context learning um so it refers to the phenomenon where transformer language models get better at predicting tokens uh when they're given a longer prompt so in other words they learn from context so uh, for example, a transformer model is better at translating from English to, to French when you give it some examples of uh, sentences in English and then sentences in French uh, first, and then you ask it to do its translation task. Um, this phenomenon was identified fairly early. So in the original uh, or the first, the, the papers sort of announcing GPT-2 and GPT-3, um, this this phenomenon was called uh, few shot learning. Um, for our purposes, we'll consider that a model is doing in context learning um, if uh, if the loss at each token uh, de decreases with increasing token index. Okay. Uh, any quick questions before we move on to the main part of the talk? We'll chat up. All right. Cool. Um, what does token index mean? Uh, so if we look at, oh, I've lost my slides. Uh, so the token index here would be would be t here. The the index of of the token x t is is t. Um, so how far along it is in the in the prompt? Thanks. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, so now let's move ahead and discuss the paper in context learning and induction heads uh, by Olsen et al. Um, this paper proposes a uh, a type of circuit called uh, an induction head, um, which performs performs a certain algorithm related to exploiting patterns in text. Um, and the main hypothesis of this paper is that induction heads constitute uh, in, in their words, the main mechanism for uh, in-context learning in transformers. Uh, and it presents um, six arguments, or sorry, five arguments uh, towards this claim. Uh, so during training, three events appear to coincide. Uh, there's a sudden drop in training loss. Uh, the model gains the ability or appears to gain the ability to do in-context learning. And these circuits, these induction head circuits, appear to form all at the same time. Um, secondly, uh, when they, when the model architecture is changed to facilitate forming these induction head circuits, so make it easier for them uh, to form, then the in-context learning ability of the model uh, increases, or it's gained earlier in training, depending on the particular type of model. Um, and when induction heads are removed or, or um, uh, disrupted during testing, then the model loses ability to do in context learning. Um, uh, another thing they observe is that in some circumstances, such as when doing translation, um, some induction heads appear to form a more appear to perform a more sophisticated version of their algorithm. Um, uh, I'll have a little bit more to say about that uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, and then for small models, um, the authors uh, have reverse engineered induction heads uh, and shown how they contribute to in-context learning. Um, we're going to focus pretty much entirely on the first argument here. Um, and to avoid sort of 
bearing the lead. Um, the reason we're doing this is is this looks like a phase transition. So um, it's it, it, you know this is why it's it, we're sort of seeing that we it, it looks relevant to to the SLT kind of stuff. Um, and interestingly as well, uh, it's observed in large language models as well as in toy models. Um, so uh, it appears to be this sort of a very clear uh, event or, or transition occurring in in uh, across transformer models of a of a huge number of scale of parameters. Um, just a point on the sort of hypothesis of this paper, I guess I'm not super convinced um, by these arguments. I don't necessarily think it's wrong, but I guess I'm not convinced by this paper that induction heads are the be all and end all of in context learning. Um, but to be honest, that's not really the point of this talk. Um, I think the most interesting part uh, of sort of for what we're talking about here is is point number one, um, this apparent phase transition, um, and the sort of general framework this paper proposes towards studying circuits in in uh, transformers and in neural networks. Um, and uh, uh, and also just so we're clear, so I didn't work on this paper. Um, I'm not affiliated with the authors in any way. Uh, so this is just what, um, you know, these are just my opinions about, about the paper, having, having read it uh, uh, a bit. Um, okay. So let's talk about this induction head circuit. So uh, the paper defines an induction head as follows. So an induction head is an attention head. So a part of the model which is performing an attention calculation which exhibits a certain type of completion algorithm behavior. So for any tokens A and B, and given a sequence of the form, some stuff, then A, B, then some other stuff, then A, that that attention head influences the prediction of the next token to be B, right? So that is an induction head looks for the previous occurrence of the current token and predicts that the next token uh, will be the one that followed that token the last time it appeared, right? Um, to be clear, oops, uh, to be clear, an induction head, to, in order to be an induction head, this should be implementing an algorithm. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a matter of memorizing that, that some B always comes after some A. It should do this for any choice of tokens A and B, okay? Now, Induction heads and, and when they form are measured uh, using a proxy, so they're not measured directly because uh, that would be very difficult or, you know, it's not clear how to do that. Um, but they're measured using a proxy called uh, the prefix matching score. So given an attention head, its prefix, matching, uh, its, prefix, its prefix matching score is computed as follows. So uh, you generate a sequence of 25 random tokens. Um, uh, and then you repeat that random sequence four times and then append a starter sequence token. Uh, and then we record the attention scores um, of, of each token as it processes this. Uh, and then the prefix matching score is the average attention assigned to the token preceding the current token in the earlier repeats. So for example, if we have a random sequence of tokens X, Y, A, B, then uh, we're looking at this last at this last point here. We're looking at uh, the token A, uh, and then this this attention head is assigning uh, attention scores to all of the preceding tokens, and we look in particular at the attention scores it assigns to the B tokens, right? Because B is the token in this random sequence which follows A, um, and then we average these attention scores, right? Um, and the the higher this prefix this the higher this average the higher the prefix the prefix matching score of an intention of an attention head the more induction heady we we consider it to be okay any any questions about that is that kind of clear i have a question <clears throat> yes um um, so you, you mentioned that the uh, induction head is uh, it, it forms if it sort of promotes the probability of observing of of B, given that the last token is A. 
uh, yep. if, if A B was seen before. Uh, I, I'm I'm guessing that is in that description is in uh, sort of a toy one block uh, model, uh, right? Uh, because now you're switching to talking about uh, attention score instead of uh, probability, or am I just they're just the same thing? Because I. I was, uh, uh are you, are you, so uh, uh, is the thing you're kind of getting at is that like if you're buried somewhere deep in a transformer, then an attention yes. head isn't predicting anything. Yes, yeah, exactly. yeah. So um, I, I agree. Uh, I think so in general. So in the whole paper, like this, this idea of an induction head is sort of buzzily defined. Um, the way the authors seem to think about it is it's is it's a part of the model which is doing two things. It's attending to the the tokens that are indicated on this diagram so if it's looking at a it's attending to the tokens b very strongly hmm. and then uh it's copying data from the representation of b into hmm. the into the current representation of a um right. which is is not quite the same thing but is kind of the same thing as predicting b um so i think the way i said it in the definition was it uh, Influence. it influences the next token prediction to be B, which is like not precise, um, but it's probably as precise as you can be and, and still sort of remain true to what the paper was saying. So, in the, um, in and, the and, time, and yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah. So the prefix matching score is only measuring the first bit, right? It's only measuring where where the attention head is directing its attention. It's not okay. measuring this copying behavior. So it's not a perfect measure. Um, but uh, I think that's okay. Um, you you yep. won't be able to have perfect measures for these algorithms. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Were there any other questions? Okay, cool. Um, where am I up to? Ah, uh, so okay, we've got a way to measure of induction, uh, a way of measuring induction heads, or, although not a perfect one, and um, maybe we don't even know exactly what an induction head is. Um, now we need a way of measuring in-context learning. Uh, so the idea of in-context learning is that the model should get better at next token prediction the further we get into the sequence. So in the paper, the in-context learning score of a model is the average loss of the 500th token in the sequence minus the average loss of the 50th token in the sequence. Uh, averaged over testing sequences of 512 tokens long. Um, note that models with a more negative in-context learning score, in theory, demonstrate a higher level of in-context learning. Um, uh, just a note on the sort of arbitrary 500th and 50th here. So the authors claim that these arbitrary choices uh, in the definition don't change things much. Um, I think it's probably not too hard to come up with something a bit better. So you could average the tokens near the start and end and look at that difference, or you could you could look at the line, look at say the gradient of of the line of best fit of uh, token loss versus uh, token index, um, and, and, and maybe that's more what we're looking at uh, here with this with this in context learning score. Um, in any case, uh, this is this is one way and the way we're going to measure in context learning in these models. Um, okay, before we go on and talk about the results, uh, let's talk about the models that, that we're gonna be looking at. So all models are uh, GPT uh, style transformers. So uh, the transformers I showed, uh, the transformer architecture, roughly speaking, that I showed at the start of the talk. Um, and we have sort of two classes of models. So small models or toy models. Um, these have between one and three layers, at least for the ones that we're going to be looking at, um, and 12 attention heads per layer. So uh, it's sort of 12 in parallel attention calculations occurring, uh, which are then averaged. Um, and these models have no fully connected component after the attention calculation. So, so we, we're calling them attention only transformers. Um, and then uh, for the large models, these are, these are, look much more like uh, sort of the the transformers you might encounter in the wild. Um, they are much bigger. Um, they have 
fully connected layers, as I showed on the diagram before. Uh, and we have six models ranging from four layers with 13 million parameters. So that's still relatively small for, for a large language model, uh, up to 40 layers with 13 billion parameters, which is, uh, I believe it's smaller than GPT-3, but larger than GPT-2. Uh, um, just a, a quick note. So we've got a one layer small model appearing here. Um, uh, we don't ex expect induction heads to, to form in models uh, with, with only one uh, transformer block, with only one layer. Um, and uh, that's because if we, for a given token, uh, there's no way to encode what its preceding token was into its current representation without, without, uh, without already performing an attention calculation uh, in, in a preceding layer. So what you should expect to see, and indeed what we will see in the results, is that um, this, this small one layer attention model doesn't do much in context learning um, and doesn't seem to form induction heads. Um, cool. Okay, now let's talk about uh, the the interesting part of this paper, um, which is this apparent phase change occurring uh, fairly early in training. So this phase change, or uh, um, I'm going to stop calling it a phase change. Uh, it's called a phase change in the paper, but uh, this, this event uh, occurs, um, uh, shows up in a, a whole, a huge number of, of, of metrics um, sort of centered around in context learning and formation of induction heads, uh, as well as the training loss. Um, so in particular, what we're seeing here is uh, the prefix matching score um, of each attention head in the model and the in context learning score um, uh, of, of the model. Um, and then uh, at the same time, we see a sudden decrease in uh, the in-context learning score. So remember, this means that the model is getting better at doing in-context learning. Um, and that this sudden decrease coincides with the formation or the apparent formation of uh, a whole bunch of induction heads. So if we look at the top plots, each line on one of these top plots is an attention head. Um, and the heads which jump from approximately zero to uh, you know much more than zero uh, are these hypothesized attention heads. Um, and of course, there are there are other attention heads that that do not do this. Um, not all attention heads in a model become induction heads. Um, uh, but but we certainly, or according to what we're measuring, we we do see induction heads uh, forming uh, at the same time as we see this decrease in in context learning score. Um, so these are the models which are the small attention only models. Um, and then we see a similar picture. Um, albeit a much messier picture with the large models. So here we have models going from the 13 million parameters, parameter models on the left to the 13 billion parameter models on the right. And um, a similar event occurs where the induction heads appear to form at the same time as a sudden improvement in the in-context learning score of the model. So um, uh, one thing I want to note here, so in the larger models we see, or you know, as the models get larger, we see sort of this picture becoming way messier. So we see many attention heads, which uh, according to what we're measuring are only partially induction heads or, or a kind of induction heads, um, achieving a final prefix matching score of around 0.5, which was, whereas in the, in the previous, uh, in the small models, you know, things were more clearly induction heads or, or not induction heads. Um, uh, but there's there's still there's still clearly some large change happening in the model at the point that it can it it uh, appears to gain the ability to do in context learning. Um, what, oh, one thing I'll mention is the coloring of these these lines in the top graphs. So uh, in in these curves, um, the attention head curves are colored by their depth within the model. So uh, increasing, you know, towards the origin end of the spectrum, these correspond, correspond to induction heads, which appear uh, in earlier layers of the model. So on average, what we're seeing is that most of the induction heads are forming in the first 
layers of the model or towards the start of the model rather than the the towards the end of the model okay um any any questions or or comments on on these these this sort of event before we before we move on okay cool um this apparent phase transition or this event uh is is sort of shows up in in other more complex measurements as well um i won't go into details about what these measurements are you can take a look at the paper um but here we see sort of something something sudden at ch at changing in in a quantity uh in the or in the in the change in loss per token per log of token index um which is this this first plot here uh which is a a, a two-dimensional quantity um and then it also shows up in something called the uh the per token loss um which is uh a 512 uh dimensional vector um, and then this plot is showing the path that its first two principal components take uh, over training um, and coinciding with with these events uh, with or this this change in the in-context learning score this apparent formation of induction heads um, we see these quantities changing changing dramatically as well yeah just to flag that this the second row is probably particularly interesting for us in connection with like what's happening geometrically at this um, transition. So this is something I hope we can look at close, more closely next week. Yeah. Um, cool. Any other questions or comments on on this before we move on and talk about the rest of the paper just briefly? Uh, uh, so there's a question in chat. Uh, would you consider the tendency for induction heads to show up in earlier layers to be some kind of analog uh, to how low level feature detectors such as edge and curve detectors show up in early layers of vision models? Something like induction in context uh, bigram detectors is a low level uh, trick to use while is a useful low level trick to use while predicting text. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's uh, that's certainly a consistent um, that uh, that idea is is sort of consistent with with what we uh, I'll just flip back and look at this uh, consistent with what we observe, right? Um, uh, yeah, uh, I suppose it's it's hard to say. I mean, it seems like a reasonable way to think about it. Um, uh, Okay, um, I guess sort of towards that view, uh, induction heads can appear to do more complex things than just uh, this induction head algorithm um, that they're that we've defined them to do. So the authors observe um, specific induction heads. So I don't actually know how they found these induction heads. It, it must have been manual, I think. Um, uh, but they observe specific induction heads. Uh, so that is attention heads which have a high prefix matching score doing a more complex version of their algorithm in certain contexts. So, for example, uh, when given the same sentence in English, French, and German, one particular induction head in the 13 billion parameter model attends to the token uh, following the translation of the current token uh, in the in the preceding sentences. Um, so that is, it sort of performs this induction head algorithm uh, along with um, a sort of English, French, German translation function uh, occurring as well. Um, and another head uh, in another, I can't remember exactly which model it's in, shows some sort of interesting attention patterns on this, on a synthetic text-based classification task uh, that they that they give it. Um, and I guess the point of this is, uh, is well, maybe induction heads aren't the the right way to look at it. Maybe maybe uh, it's a uh, it's sort of a, a symptom of, of of a bit of a more complex algorithm that's going that's going on here. And and maybe when we observe these attention heads doing doing other things, um, uh, we 
we're sort of seeing that well in induction heads uh you know or just just having this attention pattern can mean that you might be implementing a more a more complicated algorithm um i think there's a question coming coming from matt in chat soon <laughs> uh, um oh here we go uh is uh translation plus induction head doing the translation could it be that it is doing the induction on some language independent representation of that token sequence that has been computed by that layer um yeah i i think that's certainly very very possible right that a previous part of the model whether it's uh, a previous attention head or uh like a um a fully connected section has in some way learned to do translation um between uh between languages um and then that uh the the induction head we're actually observing is is simply um performing its normal induction algorithm on uh on the uh the that that representation right um so matt has asked would you still consider that to be a more complex induction head um uh i don't know i guess like we're only measuring like in order to fully be an induction head like i guess i guess we're not measuring all neurons in in the circuit right simply measuring the attention pattern doesn't isn't enough like simply looking at the attention pattern that's not enough to do the induction algorithm so we're already not measuring all neurons in this in this induction circuit right so i guess it sort of draws the line as, as you know what what do you consider to be an algorithm do you consider you know there's a translation algorithm happening followed by this copying algorithm happening or do you consider that all to be to be one one big algorithm uh in one um one one slight difference I, I will point out though that that maybe points it as a, a more sort of integrated thing uh in the in the translation task is um obviously in, in French German and English um word ordering doesn't like it's not just a matter of you know looking up at it in the dictionary and changing one word to the other like word ordering can change and um at least as someone who uh is not fluent in French or German um it it seems like it's directing its attention appropriately in that case right so it's not just looking at the next token it's sort of looking at the next token including uh in this included in this word ordering uh you change between between the languages um cool um, um but yeah it's as i said it's like um there's a there's a really nice sort of uh i guess interactive visualization of this uh in in the paper so um it, it's it's interesting to play around with that and sort of look at look at where attention is going um uh in the models um, cool question. any other questions yeah. or yeah i do have a question so are they you you, you did mention that they, you, you don't know how they how they uh find this particular head uh doing something more complex and uh, uh but but did they say anything about other um induction head not doing not doing uh this french translation um thing so so we were talking about whether or not uh this 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 induction head is really just a, a pure induction head but but acting on some earlier thing so a, a way to check that would be whether or not some uh um some other induction head sort of has the same property yeah um i would guess that that no this is not the case for all induction heads just based on how the paper is is written okay. i think um it would be you, you know they're, they're fairly clear that this is a, a cherry picked uh okay. induction head they give its its index within within the layer and which layer it's in and um and things so i think you know uh it, it's probable that that's the only one they found I, I imagine they would have mentioned other ones that they found that that performed this this task okay. um yeah thank you yeah but i guess I, I don't know they don't give much detail as to how they search for this uh how much they search for this so i guess it's possible depending on how they did it there's there was there were some out there that they just didn't find um i'm not i'm not sure cool um 
yeah so uh, what i was saying uh, some attention heads appear to implement a more general version of of the induction algorithm uh, so let's just summarize uh, the rest of the paper. Um, I sort of don't have too much else to say on this. It's all very interesting. Um, and you can take a look uh, at the paper, obviously. Um, um, so they made changes to the architecture to make induction heads easier to form. Um, so they, uh, when they made this change, so this included the one layer um, models where induction heads weren't able to form. And when they made this change, these one layer models uh, uh, also underwent this event where in context learning score falls suddenly um, and uh, induction heads appear to form. Uh, and in the case of the two and three layer models uh, and four and five and six, um, they uh, this phase transition occurred essentially like immediately within training. Uh, it was at least shifted much, much earlier within training. Um, you can take a look at exactly how they changed this architecture uh, to, to make induction heads easier to form. Um, they, they also um, disrupted induction heads during test uh, in order to show that in some sense they were sort of causally responsible for, for in-context learning. Um, and then in, in a previous paper, they reverse engineered um, some implementations of induction heads in uh in some small models uh and we're able to sort of show how they work and how they might contribute to, to in-context learning um okay so we can kind of view this paper as a general sort of framework uh or approach to studying circuits in in transformer models so um here's here's your recipe if you want to go home and, and do this yourself uh so identify some interesting property or phenomenon in your model. So in, in the case of this paper, the phenomenon they identified was in-context learning. Find a way to measure it. In this case, we use the in-context learning score. Uh, and then identify an algorithm which you think must be associated to, to, to this phenomenon in some way. So in this case, it was this sort of induction head copying, uh, copying algorithm. And then finally, find a way to measure whether or not this algorithm is occurring. Um, and in this case, it was the prefix matching score. Um, so how does this all connect with, with the SLT and the phase transitions and the stuff we've been talking about in this, this seminar? So, so one open question is, is whether this sort of circuit formation event corresponds with a, general, a genuine phase transition um, in the sense of SLT of, of the model. Right. Um, and uh, I guess the sort of, sort of converse uh, of this is do phase transitions, so phase transitions in the sense of SLT, always result in, or, or maybe a better way to think of it is do they always arise because of circuit formation or algorithm uh, formation within, within our models? Um, uh, yeah. Who knows, right? Um, uh another i guess the last point i wanted to maybe bring attention to is sort of a lot of these um uh, a lot of these sort of measurements so the in context learning score prefix matching score i mean they make sense they they seem to measure what the, the thing that we we we're, we're hoping that they do um uh but i imagine that there's probably a fair bit of trial and error in coming up with these measurements um so can can singular learning theory or give us more principled ways of measuring circuit formation or measuring these phenomenons um, and can phase transitions and sort of relatedly can can phase transitions in the sense of SLT give us a, a place to search for circuits forming. So if we have a predicted phase transition occurring in a model, um, but we're not able to measure it in the model uh, or, you know, there's not something obvious happening in the model, is that a place that we could look for, for certain circuits forming uh, and things like that? Okay. Uh, what do you mean by some not something obvious happening in the model? I don't quite follow. Oh, so say say you've say we've uh, you know we've got a transform model. Um, we've done you know SLT magic, and we predict that there's a phase transition occurring. You know, a uh, hundred thousand tokens into into training. Um, but you know, from sort of looking at the the quantities that we might normally look at, like the loss and you know other other things. Oh, I see. Um, 
uh-huh. we don't we don't seem to see anything happening is that a point that we could look for you know are there circuits forming at this point i mean how you would do that i've got no idea but um it's a, so what you mean is it's a, so you're saying that the the usual signals we're looking at might not be indicating something happening but that's because we're not measuring enough things not because it's not there yes Project. yeah yeah precisely yeah yeah okay. yeah um and then and then i guess one one step beyond that is that does that correspond with the the transformer implementing an algorithm at that point right sort of with the view to interpretability and and things like that can i okay i don't have the answers to any of these yep (laughs) um i was gonna ask if you had any intuition for the second point in the slt heading there do phase transitions always arise due to circuit formation no, so I have, have like, <laughs> absolutely no intuition for this. Um, I think, yeah, like really interesting. Oh, yeah, okay. like <laughs> yeah. it'd be cool. It'd be really cool if you could, if could you like, you know, the dream, right, is like, could you like draw a theoretical link between sort of statistical physics phase transitions and algorithms being implemented within within a transformer? Um but yeah, I've got no idea whether that's possible or true or or what. Yeah. Maybe I'll briefly ask Dan next to me if he has any intuition <laughs> on that point. I do believe in Rowan's conjecture, yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? I don't have any more slides. So are there any other questions or anything else people want to well, let's discuss? Thank, thank Rowan first. Yeah, more questions. Matt is typing a question. Type a question, Matt. You must have a question. <laughs> <laughs> or, or a pretty animation. Now you've raised the bar. I'm going to be <laughs> I'm going to be waiting for you to produce something every talk now. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe another question for you then, Rowan. Is there so when it comes to trying to apply an SLT lens to this stuff. Is there any more simple model, any more simple like toy model in this spirit that one could analyze? Or is this literally like as basic as it can get to observe this phenomena at all? Um so you want you want a more simple model than than these these small models? Is that what you're you're uh, asking yeah, for? I guess I yeah, I guess, yeah, that's pretty much the question. Something more tractable that one might be able to analyze more easily. Can I so ask? yeah, so I think Jesse has well, first yeah, of all the question like maybe not oh, yeah. simpler, but just other toy models of face transitions. Mm. Mm-hmm. What are the next uh, steps? We want kind of a zoo of these to study. Um, I guess we have the superposition model. Induction head seems like a very natural next step. Yeah, modular arithmetic. there's also the, oh. yeah, so there's the modular arithmetic. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't want to skip to the end, but I'll, I'll send my slides. The link to that paper is is on my very last references slide. Um, from memory, that's still a pretty big, well, well not, not big by sort of GPT standards, but big by SLT standards um transformer um everything uh, is uh, (laughs) yeah um i think so like if we look at these like okay what do we really need so we definitely need two attention head layers to have any hope of studying this induction algorithm right like you just don't observe the phase transition occurring at all in one layer attention models okay um now in these small models so we could say okay let's look at a two layer attention uh two sort of transformer block models um then we in these models we have 12 attention heads per layer maybe we can get away with less um i think like i have no idea whether this is true or not but to anticipate the potential issue with this is that well if it doesn't have enough intent attention heads 
then it won't be able to dedicate an attention head to just doing this induction algorithm. And it might need to do other stuff as well, which may just mean we don't see this occurring in, in significantly yeah. smaller models or, or what. Um, the other sort of complicating factor here is that we need, in order to train these models um, and, and you know use these models because they're language models, we need an embedding and, and unembedding uh, uh, layers. Right. So, so these I've, I've been talking about. So, all these parameters are parameters of the attention uh, of the transformer block section of these models. Um, but uh, they don't account for the, for the embedding and unembedding layers. And I guess maybe that's not a super big problem. You could, you could maybe sort of take those as a black box and then just think about the transformer block section as, as being a model that maps from one random. Rn dimensional space to another random Rm dimensional space, and um, take your your fixed um, embedding and unembedding layers as sort of the way you understand that space. Um, but but yeah, I I I don't know. I guess is the short the short answer to what you're asking. Can I I'll refine the question ever so slightly. Then in language models, language is inherently a very complicated piece of data right and so like it seems to me just looking from afar that of course you're going to need some like moderately sized model for example you've got written there like 13 million parameters like in order to capture anything that's going on in general language you're going to need some kind of big reasonably kind of intractable model is there do you know of any like toy language models in a sense that are far more um concise in their what language they're dealing with and stuff and so instead of needing to learn like all of english grammar maybe it's mm -hmm. just about i don't know animals or something like the dog has ears or, i'm not sure but ron can, can i take this one <laughs> I mean, I, you I, are yeah, go ahead. I, don't know. I have one answer for this is this a uh, recent storybook I don't remember exactly what it was called, but they trained the transformer on a vocab of like 500 words, mm -hmm. kindergarten level words. And the, the model did well. And I think in, uh, along some metrics, you know, a better causal reasoning ability or something than, than similarly sized English language models. Mm -hmm. So that's an option. And more things are coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I like, it feels to me like that would be a, a worthwhile thing to to think okay. about is <laughs> um, working on a project with a few other people who will be here next week uh, on creating a, a transformer on Toki Pono, which is a constructed language of 137 words. Exceptionally simple. You can tokenize each word individually. So should be easier to interpret, might actually lead to this kind of thing. Mm. Cool. I Do you guess, have anything yeah. you want to add, Rowan? Yeah, um, like in in some sense, like so transformers are doing sequence modeling, right? And in some sense, the fact that we really want to do sequence modeling on language is making things hard for ourselves because language is is discrete, uh, which means we need these embedding steps, um, and and all of that. So so maybe a better venue or you know another venue to look for sort of simple toy models is is just looking for different sequences to model like just just make them up and then you can scrap your unembedding layers um so you can scrap your embedding layers maybe you can simplify your unembedding layers um uh you know you can make everything continuous and and nice uh and 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 model things model things like that um so may, maybe that would be the toy the toy model of of induction heads that you'd want to do you just need to make sure you have sort of some non-trivial sort of structure to your sequences um so there's something to do in context learning on uh and uh yeah maybe maybe that would be the way to way to go but then i guess you lose sort of anything unique that's happening because of language um so yeah. so yeah i think uh there's there's a paper or there's there's some recent stuff on um on Othello GPT, uh, and that, as as you said, kind of loses anything that's language specific, 
but is is kind of a a small enough thing you know with a, a vocabulary of only only 60 60 tokens in it that it seems you know like it's actually vaguely tractable but still definitely capturing very interesting structure for you know kind of the the rules of a board game mm -hmm. yep because you definitely what like there's sort of two um you've got the two things right you've got the model and then you've got the actual underlying truth and if you're interested in studying phase transitions in the model at least part of that would involve trying to make the truth like as simple as possible just so you can isolate what's going on with the models themselves and yeah it seems at the moment it's like oh we have these large language models that are doing these amazing things and it's just like so hard to get a grasp on what's happening at that level of scale so yeah that's cool about othello gpt It can't be too simple though, right? The distribution on sequence. Like if it's if it has the Markov property, then there's no reason for the model to do this induction head yeah. calculation, right? So so like you do need some level of complexity in your in your data distribution to to sort of even study this, I, I would guess. Uh there's a question in the chat that maybe I'll I'll take. So the question is about uh how does uh, how do phase transitions in SGD steps fit into the SLT picture? Yeah, it's not completely clear. There's some reason to think they're related or that uh, saying something about phase transitions in the Bayesian posterior informs a discussion about uh, phase transitions or something that looks like a phase transition in SGD steps. Um, that's not at the level of a theorem, but uh, both are controlled ultimately by the geometry of the level sets, right? Both the behavior of the trajectories, as Jesse was describing in his talk, uh, and the phase transitions in the Bayesian posterior, both are clearly controlled by the nature and geometry of level sets. And that doesn't mean that you know they tell anything necessarily about each other, but they they both reflect the same underlying structure, and that's maybe the high level reason to think they're useful. Um, the the description of phases and phase transitions in in data set size or other parameters within the Bayesian context might say something about the kinds of phase transitions we see in these examples. But at this point, I think it's mainly an empirical question. So if we look at a bunch of examples and we have some information about phase transitions in the Bayesian posterior. And then we look and see very parallel structures, including things uh, like what we'll see tomorrow um, in SGD steps, then, well, it's pretty reasonable to take as a working hypothesis that one can inform a discussion of the other. But at this point, it's at that level, yeah. I think I got a kind of a related, uh... Related question. Uh, uh, so, if I remember correctly, the, the the phase transition diagram that is is as as this question is asking is uh, trans, is a phase transition in epoch in, in time. Um, what surprises? Yeah, that one. Uh, what surprises me is uh, uh, is that they form. You know, uh, I'm not surprised that they, they form, but that they form at the same time. Um, the so i kind of just uh is is it is it kind of a um they they use the same uh token sequence uh the the, the training data set uh the, 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 they they feed in in the same order or is this a a feature of language just just um the uh, the first hundred thousand uh token all have the same distribution in terms of re reference to previous token uh it's i'm kind of just asking is is there any detail about this uh so do you mean the same time across different models oh that that's not different oh that's a, not not a different run is it those are no those, no those... so these this is measuring two different things on so looking vertically that's measuring two different things of the same model, the same training run. Oh, but but um, each line in the, say the, the top middle plot 
uh, each line yep. is a different induction head. Is is that correct? Yep. Uh, different exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Form, right. For me, at a that okay that okay. So scratch my question. I I thought so. If I if I run if I run this again, they 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 will probably form at pr probably different time, which might be so. If they form at the same time, that would be a, another interesting phenomena. But it is still interesting that all the induction have formed at the same time. Um, hmm. It there's there's no discussion about that in. Uh, sort of, I, I don't think so beyond like, wow, isn't that interesting? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I think, I think that's the sort of the big picture here is that like, you know, these models, there's a, there's this window where suddenly lots of stuff changes in the model. Um, yeah. and, uh, I think the, the grokking paper, so the paper that discusses um, modular addition in circuits. I, from memory, that that talks about or talks a little bit about why stuff changes at once. Maybe is someone able to? Does someone else also remember that? Um, uh, a, yeah, a, maybe there's not. A there's a just so story about it. I, I don't know that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, could you go back to the the blue pictures? <laughs> you know which ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah this i mean rowan and i were talking about this the other day so maybe it's worth noting that something here that's quite striking i, I don't know how to read this picture anymore rowan but i remember the conclusion which was that uh it makes this progress on, on in context learning uh on this on this task at the point of the trace transition but then basically doesn't improve after that is, is that the right reading yeah like all the progress it makes is in this phase transition really like and then after yeah that, that was that well that's clear that's more clear from this diagram this this bottom diagram where oh, it's, it's in context it's learning score yeah drops and then just hits minus 0.4 um this one's just showing so on the uh horizontal axis um we're sort of seeing the phase transitions as as the model continues to train um, on the vertical axis, we're seeing it's it's loss in the token or it's change in loss in the token index. Um, yeah. And here we see it's it's very dark blue near the top of the diagram because it's it's uh, loss in the token index is decreasing quite rapidly at this point. And then as it gets further into the context, um, it's not able to extract continue to extract more information from from the context. Uh, I guess is how I read this plot. Any further questions here? All right. Well, uh, Rowan's got to go get on a plane now. So we'll see you <laughs> next week. Thanks, Rowan. Yep. Uh, see you next week. All right. Bye. Yeah. Okay. We can end the meeting on that one.